Nigeria produced 1.405 million barrels of crude oil per day on average in September, a decrease from up to 33,000 barrels. Now, OPEC reported in its October oil market report that Nigeria's crude oil production dropped from 1.438 million barrels per day in August. According to direct communication, Nigeria produced an average of 1.324 million barrels of crude oil per day in September, which was a decrease of 27,000 barrels from the previous month's production. Now, for more on these stories, we're joined by portfolio analyst, fixed income solution at FBN Quest Asset Management, Ayoluade Ogunwale. Ayoluade, good morning. It's good great morning. to have you on the show. Good morning. Glad right, to be yeah. here. All right, well, let's begin with oil prices update as we've seen here, you know, for Tuesday morning. What, and what are the key drivers surrounding this? Uh, thank you very much for that question. Uh, so, what we've seen play out in the oil market, uh, so just like you rightly pointed out, we saw the OPEC Plus monthly uh, reports coming out and revising down the outlook on demand. Uh, so in my own opinion, I think it's more of a reality coming out to OPEC. Uh, we've all been aware of the woes concerning China in terms of reducing demand and the gradual shift from uh, fuel to renewable energy. Uh, so the reaction yesterday in the market was largely tied to the uh, OPEC plus demand uh, reports that came out where they revised uh, the 2024 uh, demand outlook from 2.03 to 1.9 as a revision of about $100,000 uh, barrels per day. Uh, they also revised the 2025 uh, outlook downward by the same uh, from by 100,000 barrels to 1.6 uh, million barrels per day. Now, what's quite telling is that this is the third consecutive downward revision from OPEC. What can we make of this? Yeah, so if, if you look at, if, if you take a look away from OPEC, uh, look at other agencies like the high year, uh, they also deliver the revised downgrade in September, uh, where they lower the outlook from uh, about 950 uh, to 900. Uh, I think yeah, yesterday also they, re they released a report following the OPEC report, uh, revising for that load uh, downward by about 40,000 uh, from 900 to 860. So it just, it just sort of reflects how heavy we are on China's demand. China is a big importer of oil. And if you look at the OPEC report, they reported that the OPEC, um, China's imports are declined by about 3% to 10.99 uh, million barrels. So that shows the significance if your largest importer is reducing its demand. So it sort of affects the overall global demand, so which is why they're reflecting to just uh, align with current realities. Right, certainly. I mean, like you also mentioned, we also saw a slash forecast for 2025. Yes. What expectations can we have for next year in terms of, of uh, growth? Yes, yeah, so looking into 2025, I think it's a period where we would see uh, more supply coming into the market. Uh, at the start, you mentioned uh, the OPEC del 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 delivery cuts, which is expected to come in in December. Initially, it was expected to start in October. Uh, it was further uh, shifted down by two months. So in December, we should see uh, the 2.2 million deliberate cuts by OPEC start coming back into the market. Uh, on the other hand, we have Russia, which also had a deliberate cut of about 28,000. Uh, so this supply will also start coming back into the market. So going into 2025, I think we'll see more supply uh, into, the, into the market. Then in terms of the demand side, right now, uh, we have China, which has been the major concern uh, that's the weakening demand. Uh, like you said, there are some stimulus that the, country, uh, the country's authorities are trying to implement uh, the monetary and the fiscal stimulus to spur uh, demand in the short term. So we'll see that play out uh, in the early of 2025. Uh, so we should see some bit of uh, increased demand from China. China space and oil should sort of rebound towards uh, the 80 uh, barrels uh, in 2025. All right, now which countries, according to the report, saw an output drop or rise? Uh, so for, for the rise, I think we have just uh, Iran, uh, which saw uh, a rise in their output, I think, to about 3.3. Uh, dollars a million barrels per day. We also have Kazakhstan uh, that saw a rise in their output and uh, Kuwait. However, uh, if you look at the laggards, right, uh, it's no brainer. We have Libya uh, topping the decline. They were down by about 400,000 um, barrels per day. Uh, so we know the crisis that Libya was just coming from, which affected their daily production. Uh, so that supply was taken out from the market. So I think they used to produce about 950. Uh, thousand barrels per day, and it went out to about 450 because of this crisis. Uh, the second thing in Nigeria is not a surprise to anyone. Uh, we've been suffering from the twin impact of uh, low investment, uh, vandalism, uh, theft. So we were also down. Uh, like you mentioned, from the direct communication, Nigeria was down about 27,000 barrels per day uh, to producing about 1.3 million. Uh, while from uh, secondary sources, we saw that we were down about 33. Looking at the both data, we were down even below our allotted quota of 2 million barrels per day. Uh, then for Iran, we saw Iran. Uh, also, uh, Iraq, sorry, also uh, seeing a decline in their monthly quota 
out of about 4.3. But the good thing for Iran is they were still above at their quota of 4 million barrels uh, for the uh, OPEC plus. Then we have Saudi Arabia also recording a marginal decline. Then Russia, uh, Russia decline was gradually due to their deliberate additional 28 uh, thousand barrels per day caught uh, into the market. All right. I mean, you spoke about China earlier, which is yeah. a you know a major consumer importer. Now, of course, we've had a declaration to you know add six trillion yuan in treasury bonds to boost the economy. Do you believe this is enough to stimulate the Chinese economy? Okay, so for the China part, I, I want to just take a step back. Yes, if you look please. at what the country has been doing, uh, we've been having cases of uh, low demand, uh, and it, the fundamental issue is the property crisis, the high debt in that region. Right, so the country has initially put in some monetary and fiscal policy prior to this announcement on Saturday. Uh, so we saw them uh, re um, revising down their IRR rates by about 50 bps to 6.6. .6. Uh, so what I sort of did was injected about 1 trillion yuan into the system uh, to try and boost the liquidity in the market. They also tried to cut down their repo rates to about 1.5% 1, 1 to try and reduce the cost on our mortgage. Then they announced a 2 trillion bond yuan uh, issuance stimulus to also try and spur economic activities and uh, improve employment. If you look at their unemployment rate also, it has been increasing. We went from 5.2 to uh, 5.3. All right, so this additional uh, 6 trillion yuan investment is expected to last for like three years uh, in terms of its implementation. And if you look at the uh, allotment, it's the, the allotted to uh, reduce some of the local government debt. So in my own opinion, in the short term, we will definitely see the demand pick up in China uh, from all of these uh, stimulus that are put in place. I think part of the uh, measures they want to do is uh, direct cash handouts to low-income households. So if you are classified as a low-income, you will get a direct cash from the Chinese government. So in the short term, you will definitely see demand pick up, which is why it affected the outlook for 2025. But looking at the long term, I think the major concern is the property crisis. Uh, if, the com if the country does not address this issue and the consumer confidence, which has declined uh, drastically in China, uh, I don't think this six trillion is enough to bring China back to the uh, pre-COVID levels where we expected them to be. Do you believe that they will be able to address those issues? Uh, so I believe they are on top of it because this is the step in the right direction, right? For them to address uh, this six trillion yuan is about 10 percent of their GDP. If you look at uh, their GDP, about 61 uh, trillion yuan. So it, it's, it should be impactful, right? Uh, that should give them some leeway to then focus and address uh, the major issues in the property sector. Very well put. Well, I mean, we've got a sense of a global market outlook from what you've said so far, but let's get let's move from China now to Nigeria. Let's get a sense of fixed income markets. What do we have there? So in the Nigeria fixed income market, I think we're in a very interesting environment right now. So where we have two powers trying to uh, dictate direction. Uh, we have the CBN on one side trying to maintain their inflation targeting and uh, in keeping interest rates at attractive levels. Uh, while the DMO, you know, their own mandate is different. They are more concerned on uh, the rising borrowing costs and they will try to bring rates as low as possible. As what we've seen sort of play out in the income space has been a toss between these two. Uh, I think the last two auctions that was held in the market sort of threw market in a shock uh, where we saw rates spike to uh, on spare levels. Then we saw some normalcy. Uh, but if we look at recent data points coming out, right, so like the auction calendar that was released, uh, we saw the 2033 is taken out of this auction calendar, uh, leaving just the 29th and the 31. And if you look at the offer size on this calendar, you will see a reduction uh, compared to the prior calendar. That's what I was just pointing to uh, reduce supply coming into uh, the quarter. Uh, but if you now look at the demand side, the liquidity that we would have expected if you had if you had this interview like a few months back, you would have had an outlook of how uh, we have a lot of liquidity coming in Q4 that should sort of spot demand. Uh, but the CBN is not letting those liquidity breathe. As the monies are coming in, they are taking them out. So we would not see that sort of demand that would have ordinarily pushed you downwards. Uh, so I think the fixed income is largely volatile and you should sort of still remain as where we have our current levels. All right. I think one thing we could all agree on is that high inflation is also a really sore point and a point of discussion. In what ways should Nigerians diversify their portfolio to, you know, absorb and cushion the shocks that um, high inflation, of course, would pose? Mm, now, this is a very interesting question. I think Nigeria has have it tough at the moment, right? Uh, we have inflation at 32.15 levels. Uh, look at the fixed income side, your yield is averaging 19 to 20 percent. Uh, even your higher risk equity market has done about, I think, 31.53. I'm still giving you negative real return in that sense, right? Uh, so what I try to advise is uh, if for investors that have the ability to edge their investment in foreign currency, uh, because if you look at our inflation, it's highly tied to our USD when we have the important inflation. Uh, so if you have investment in USD, you can sort of edge yourself against inflation. Uh, when you have the currency weakens, you know, you have an investment that is giving you uh, coverage for that, uh, for that uh, downgrading uh, currency. Uh, so you have uh, outlets like your USD mutual funds uh, from asset management houses that you can explore uh, to edge your investments uh, by giving yourself some exposure to uh, USD investments. What about assets. those who are just, you know, just chilling and looking at the money market? Uh, so That's quite low risk. <laughs> yeah, so 
ordinarily, as in primarily, you need to manage your risk and return, right? Uh, for those looking at, if, if you don't have the risk appetite to take or to exp give yourself exposure to some of these vehicles, uh, you have the money market that is still doing, I think, 20%. Uh, is it a good time <laughs> to be on the money market? <laughs> it, it is actually a good time to be in the money okay. market because if you look at uh, the uh, inflation at 33, you don't have an, if, if, if your risk capital does not give you the leeway to go into asset classes that can give you such return to cover, and you have in your money market, to an extent you're being covered, your negative return is being reduced, and you staying and doing nothing. You leave your money in your savings bank, you're getting less than 1% uh, of the NPR, but you put it in your money market fund, giving you 20, 20 uh, between you and I, I think that's quite decent return to end on your investment. It actually really is. Yeah. It really is. But you know, looking at the at the macro space, of course, you've just given us you know some tips as to how to sort of navigate and circumvent the situation. But in terms of curbing high inflation, do you believe that the efforts that we have so far uh, will yield results sooner? Than later. So primarily, I'm of the school of thought that our inflation is more of a cost push and not demand factor. Uh, but we cannot totally discount the impact of FX on inflation, which is why we've seen the CBN deliberate action to try and manage liquidity in the system. Because the, the, the uh, linkage is when the system is highly liquid, there are some players that are betting on FX, which is driving the demand and putting it in that space. Uh, so I think it's a long shot. Uh, the, the, the fundamental issue is the sub supply basket, right? Uh, if you don't have the reserve, basket, the reserve numbers growing, uh, to comfortable levels, you don't see uh, that currency coming down to where we would see inflation and impacts coming down. Uh, so what the CBN is doing, I think for me, is a short fix, right? Uh, which is focus more on the long time. Look at the OPEC numbers that came out. Uh, oil production still keeps going down. Uh, that would affect your accretion to uh, reserve. It will affect investor sentiment in your country. FBIs will not be willing to come. Uh, if you look at your return on your local assets compared to the likes like Compared to countries like Egypt, uh, which have like 26, 27 percent, you, you're having 20, 25. If I'm an FPI ordinarily, that would be, that's a disincentive for me to come into your country. So I think these are other measures that the um, CBN can look at in a bit to attract more FX to the uh, external reserve balance and give them more power to even intervene. And looking at the way they've been intervening in the market, I think if they want to, if they want a more realistic uh, impact, uh, we should see more frequent uh, intervention uh, from the CBN rather than the unannounced one-off that we see. Uh, so it's a long shot. Uh, I think they are doing what they are. Their job is very tough. I don't envy anybody in the CBN, in the CBN right now, but I think the more focus should be on uh, expanding the source of uh, external reserve for the country right, right because now. there is a multiplier effect to yes. every action, right? Ayola I want to thank you so much for joining us on the Global Business Report, thank and we'll you. see you again very soon.